Hi, well actually this is the last video. We're going to be talking about credit derivatives and uh, leading up to what happened with the banking crisis. Um, I did actually just insert a small slide about credit VAR um, at the end of the previous section. Um, you can read that yourself. We're not going to go into any detail about credit bar. As I said, the majority, in fact, the rest of this module is really focusing on market risk and regulations and backtesting and things like that. Uh, stress testing, scenario analysis, but, but we're not going to go into any more detail about credit bar. There's just this last section um, and um, leading up to this nice film called The Big Short to help you understand actually what happened. It's a difficult film, but it's really interesting. So I hope you get to watch it. Okay, so um, credit derivatives, what are they? Well, a credit derivative is an instrument or a technique. It doesn't have to be an actual instrument, like a tranching technique, that's part of a derivative. Um, well, they're designed to separate the credit risk of some corporate or sovereign borrower and transfer it to an entity other than the corporate or so sovereign. So if, I am a, if I've issued a bond, then I have credit risk to whoever's bought it. But it's designed to the person who's bought the bond can actually sell it on somehow. Or if I have a loan from Santander Bank, um, Santander Bank can securitize that loan and, and pass on the risk that I might default to somebody else. And there are two types. There's the funded credit derivatives, which is backed typically by a pool of assets. They could include um, uh, car loans or it could be student loans or, you know, lots of different loans at the moment um, that have actually been made by peer-to-peer -peer lenders. So it's not just banks. Um, and it would be rated by agencies such as Moody's or S&P. Peer-to-peer -peer lenders also use rating agencies, maybe not Moody's or S&P, but they, when peer-to-peer -peer lenders securitize their loan, they get them rated as well. So most derivatives of this type are asset-backed securities or collateralized debt obligations. We'll talk about those in a minute. And then the unfunded credit derivatives is one where the protect credit protection is bought and sold between two counterparties without the person selling the protection, the issuer of the CDS, some big bank who's basically like an insurance company, um, but they don't have to put up any money. They have to pay out like the premium, like an insurance premium, if there is a credit event. So it's almost like a bet on a credit event as well. We'll talk about a naked CDS at the end of this video and see how betting on the um, default of um, various mortgage-backed securities precipitated the banking crisis in 2008. So, as I said, these credit default swaps are the major type of unfunded credit derivatives, and they're still being traded today vast, maybe not as much as interest rate swaps, but still when you look at some um, the accounts from the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, you see vast amounts of trading nominal on CDSs. So starting at the base, what is an asset-backed security? So there's a pool of underlying assets, for example, car loans or credit cards, and these provide collateral for paying like coupons. So normally, you know, if you buy a bond from Shell, then the coupons you get as a bondholder should be paid by the profits of the company. But with an ABS, if you buy an ABS from some peer-to-peer -peer lender, um, you're being given coupons on that ABS, but the coupons are paid by the loan payments that the peer-to-peer -peer lender gets from, I don't know, the student loans that it's made. So it receives the money and then it, it pays on those coupons um, from the, what we call the collateral um, of that ABS. So pooling these assets into instruments allows them to be sold on to general investors. So the peer-to-peer -peer loan um, company uh, Lending Club actually securitizes a lot of its loans and, and sells them to JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and you know, major investment banks. 
This is a process called securitization. It makes a security out of loans or anything else. It doesn't have to be loans. Um, it could be um, any type of asset. So it allows the risk of investing in the asset class to be diversified because each particular security represents just a fraction of the total value of the pool of assets. So you buy a, a, um, an ABS, which has got maybe a thousand assets underneath it. And if one of them goes bust, then, or doesn't pay, then it's only a very small influence on the whole. This is something, this asset securitization goes way back to the 1970s. In fact, it originated by the US Government National Mortgage Association, GNMA, also called Ginny May who sold mortgage-backed securities in the capital markets. Of course, this all went pear-shaped during the banking crisis, but they were bailed out by the US government, along with all the investment banks that had bought the CDOs on these um, asset securitizations. So a mortgage-backed security is a particular example. It's just like a bond, and the payments come from the payments on mortgages. But on top of that, once it's securitized, you can then chop it up into what's called a collateralized debt obligation. And um, as I said, these are all examples of funded credit derivatives. So each tranche that you cut up of the CDO will have a different credit rating from Moody's or S&P. Um, not like CDSs, they don't have credit rating. So what exactly is a collateralized debt obligation or CDO? It's a structured ABS, which pays investors in a prescribed sequence, depending on the default of the loans, for example, you know, the mortgages um, that are in the different tranches. So it allows investors to take different slices, um, depending on their risk appetite. If they want to be really risky, they buy the sort of equity tranche, they get a very high yield on that. Um, but if they are very risk averse, they would buy the senior tranche, which wouldn't give them so such high yields, but they're much less likely to lose their money. So the sequence of the cash flows from the pool has some sort of seniority in the default structure. There's the first loan to default, or in fact, for a whole tranche, there's the first 10 loans to default or the first 100 loans to default. And if some of them default, they're not actually labeled, it's just, you know, whichever defaults, um, then the, the cash collected by the CDO may not be sufficient to pay all the investors. So those in the lowest, most junior tranches would suffer the first losses. Here's a picture of what happens. So you may have, for example, 100 or more mortgages that are all pretty highly rated. And they could be car loans or student loans or credit card debt or whatever. Okay. And uh, so this is the original ABS, but then the cash flows go to pay the senior mezzanine and equity. And the first one of these mortgages to default would be taken off the payment made to the equity tranche. Maybe there's um, 50 here, 25 in the mezzanine and the first 20 to default not labeled, just whatever the first to default would go into the equity tranche. And once 25 of default, you'd never get any more income from the equity pool if you bought that. If you bought part of the mezzanine tranche, you would continue to get your LIBOR plus 200 basis points, a bigger yield than the original ABS because it's more risky. It's only got a BBB rating, whereas the original ABS had a double A rating. So you'd continue to get that, but then it would go down as more and more defaults. And eventually that would go and you'd be eating into the senior tranche, okay? So the last investors to lose from the defaults are the safest, most senior tranches. So they get the lowest interest rates, for example, LIBOR plus only 60 basis points. Okay, now for the, um, the um, unfunded credit derivative, the CDS. As I said before, it's a bit like an insurance payment. So I might decide that um, I've bought um, a, an, a bond or an MBS or some tranche of CDO, some credit risky product, okay? And I want to buy insurance on default. So what I'll do is I'll pay a small payment every 
every three months or every month, whatever it is, agreed to some bank who's the protection seller. And, I can, and that will be, say, I bought five years CDS. It will go on for five years unless that bond that I bought the protection against defaults, in which case I get a payoff. Uh, it's like, a, like an insurance premium, okay? And then the CDS stops in that case. But the person who um, sold the CDS generally just takes the insurance premiums and as long as there's no default, they don't have to pay off at all. Now, normally you would expect that whoever, if I bought a CDS and I was paying for, for protection, I would own the bond. And that's the case in Europe and the UK. But in the US, anybody can buy protection against anything. So it becomes like a bet. So this idea of what's called a naked CDS, which is based on some reference credit, such as a bond or a CDO, that doesn't have to be held by me. I can still buy a CDS and I can make those payments every month if I want. And I'm betting on that bond or that CDO tranche or whatever going bankrupt. And then I get my payoff. That's exactly what Michael Barry did in the big short. He took CDS protection on loads and loads of collateralized debt obligations that he didn't own. In fact, the, per the banks that owned the CDOs were JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Bear Stern, Lehman Brothers, all the big investment banks. And Michael Barry was a hedge fund and he had a lot of money from investors. And all he did was pay the premiums on CDOs, betting on the, um, the default of those, um, uh, those uh, tranches in the CDOs. And who sold him the CDSs? Those same banks. So <laughs> there's a very nice point in the film where Goldman Sachs actually realized that they own the CDOs and they have also sold CDS protection on those CDOs going default. So if, if the CDOs defaulted, they would not only lose the CDO income, but they would have to pay for it in the insurance that they'd sold to Michael Barry and other hedge funds as well. So there's this sort of moment where they realize what they did. So they collaborated with the rating agencies, Moody's and S&P, particularly S&P. And they kept the credit ratings high as long as it took for them to export the CDOs to Europe via London, of course, because London is where they have the offices that then get sold on to Germany, to Italy, to Greece, also to Japan. So this toxic debt, they knew that those mortgages were going to default because far too many mortgages had been sold. And there were CDOs of CDOs, uh, you know, so many of them owned by the big investment banks. And once they realized that they actually had these CDSs as well, they needed to offload the CDOs uh, at least. And they did that in time so that when they still had to pay Michael Barry for the decal that did default, they had to pay Michael Barry. He made something like 7 billion out of the, um, the protection that he bought. At least those banks, well, some of them still got, got burned like Lehman Brothers and Bear Stern, they did. Um, and of course, then it was a sort of systemic risk that precipitated the whole banking crisis. Okay, so that's it for this topic. See you in topic three.